minutes to seven. Uh, when TSB customers couldn't log on to their internet accounts and the bank's phone lines were blocked, many of them went to their local branch for help, obviously. Yeah, the recent banking hacks, IT breakdowns have highlighted the importance to lots of customers of having a local bank on the high street and having access to it. But of course, that's easier said than done, isn't it? Lots of them disappearing. Yeah, there is new research from which... And that shows that 60 bank branches are closing every week across the UK. And to put that into context, more than 670 have shut already this year. So that puts 2018 on track to be worse than last year when 879 closed their doors. And that was thought to be a record. Yeah, the worst hit areas of the UK by bank closures are Scotland. Uh, the northwest of England and the southeast of England. Now, banks say they give plenty of notice when they're closing branches and that the post office and online accounts and mobile services can be used instead. But groups who represent uh, the disabled, the elderly, small businesses disagree. Well, Mike Cherry is the national chairman of the Federation of Small Businesses and is one of those dissenting voices. Good morning, Mike. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Um, why do you disagree with the alternatives or when you're told the banks say there are alternatives on offer and that oh. this is just natural? It's, it's a part of business. It's part of the business climate at the moment. It's absolutely crucial that small businesses have good access to the funds that they need when they need it. And, of course, with so many banks closing, it's not just affecting local communities, it's badly affecting local small businesses. Businesses are having to travel much, much further just to bank their own cash, for instance, as we've seen with the huge problems around TSB and previously with NatWest on their IT infrastructure. When you need to have access to pay your wages, you don't have it. And we just need to get this stopped at the present time because it is accelerating and has been for the last couple of years. But they're saying that you can use post offices or mobile banking trucks as viable alternatives. Why are they not working? Well, if you try and have a little van that toddles around in Scotland for a few minutes to do your banking, that is just not sufficient. It, it, so many areas do not have broadband access or mobile connectivity still. So going online is not always an option that you have. And the local post office infrastructure just is not capable of dealing with many small business requirements. What are, what are your members, what are small businesses saying to you about the practical ways in which they're affected by banks closing? They have to travel more. That increases their costs. They have to pay for parking if they can get access to a branch. And it may be 20, 40 miles away. So they're having to take time out of actually doing their business uh, to actually bank. But isn't that just business? We all have to do that. We all have to travel to the bank. We all have to travel to work. We, you know, we, if we need a car, we need to use public transport. That's just the way of the world. Well, not when your branches are closing at such a rate without taking notice of what the options are, without consulting properly with businesses uh, and leaving businesses, quite frankly, having to take more and more time out, even if you phone up to try and get access to somebody uh, who may be your local relationship manager, it can take you at least half an hour to get through their systems and things like that. And you don't always have access to the person that you need if you have a problem. Isn't it our fault, though, whether we're individuals or whether we're businesses, we just haven't been using those banks on the high street enough, and that's why they're closing them down? Well, we all accept that there is a commercial aspect to this. But unless you have the necessary facilities for small businesses to be able to do their banking, then you are going to have problems. You have less footfall on the high streets. That affects local communities as well. And you've got another problem coming up next month, which is where the interchange fee, which is the fee that is paid by the card providers to the uh, cash network, that is going to be reduced and you run the risk of a substantial number of the cash machines that we all use to get cash daily are going to be shut down as well. So we've got a perfect storm at the moment. OK, well, we'll talk to you. I'm no doubt we'll be talking about it again in next month when that happens. Thanks very much, Mike Cherry from the Federation of Small Businesses. The story is that Universal Credit, the government's flagship benefit scheme, is not delivering value for money. It's too slow and it's causing financial hardship. That is according to a highly critical report today by the National Audit Office. Almost one million people currently receive Universal Credit, which is expected to rise to 10 million in 2023. Now, responding to the criticism, ministers say it is a system fit for the modern world. Here's more from our social affairs correspondent, Michael Buchanan. Anderson Armstrong has been on Universal Credit since August. Before then, he worked as a chef and bought his bike. 
but when he lost his job, he built up debts waiting seven weeks for his first benefit payment and says he now lives on £18 a week. Go to the supermarket and then an hour before they close, they reduce food to the, to the lowest possible price. You know, something might be five quid and you might get it for about, what, pound fifty or a pound or something like that. And so, you know, you, you shop clever, you box clever around that. Today's report says Anderson is not alone, that too many people are struggling with universal credit. Last year, 40% of claimants waited 11 weeks for their first payment. 8% actually waited almost eight months. There was usually an increase in rent arrears and the use of food banks when universal credit was ruled out in an area. A significant minority, we think, are struggling to cope with making a claim online. They're struggling to cope whilst they wait for their first payment and they're struggling to cope with the fluctuating income that they get on universal credit. Despite that, the National Audit Office says the Department for Work and Pensions does not accept the benefit causes hardship. Ministers say they're building a flexible benefit fit for the 21st century and that they're making significant improvements to the delivery of universal credit. Michael Buchanan, BBC News. Proposed to make the benefit system simpler and more efficient. What are we talking about? Universal credit. But for many, it has been confusing and has left some worse off. Yeah, the government says it's making significant improvements to the scheme as the rollout continues across the country. But a report out today says ministers are in denial about the effect that it's having on the lives of thousands of people. Well, joining us now is Kayleigh Hignall, who's the head of welfare policy at Citizens Advice. Good morning. And Edward Boyd from the think tank, the Centre for Social Justice, who's in our Westminster studio. Good morning to you both. Um, Hayley, let's start with you. So. Uh, there are, there are criticisms now, the National Audit Office is saying this is just not fit for purpose, it's not fit for the 21st century. What has gone wrong with universal credit? This is a huge benefit reform. It's going to affect a lot of people and a lot of different groups of people. There is some evidence that it's working for some groups, a good portion of people. But for others, they're really facing some challenges and struggles, getting on the benefit, getting paid on time and making sure they can keep their finances under control. Well, in terms of numbers, and you say some are benefiting, some are not, can, mm. have, can you break that down? So it looks like a good one in five people are really struggling with this benefit. Now, the worrying thing that we see in the the National Audit Office report today is that people who face extra challenges or potentially extra costs. So people who are carers, people who may have a severe disability, working parents who are paying for childcare costs. So when things go wrong for these people, it has a real impact. And on how them. is that different now to compare to what it was in terms of the system before? Because there were like five or six things you could compare. The idea was this, this brought it all together. That's it. The but aims, those same people would have had problems, wouldn't they? The aims and principles of universal credit are good aims and principles. We really agree with them. And actually, if this benefit is designed and delivered well, it really will bring some additional benefits and tackle some of the problems we see in the current system. The challenge here is making sure it works for all of those people, making sure it works not just on paper but in practice and making sure we don't make people financially worse off or destabilise their finances in the process of rolling it out. Listen to Edward Boyd. Edward, do you accept it's just not working properly for enough people right now? Um, I don't think I do. I think it's in some ways a very helpful NAO report and some of the media around it is different from what it says in the detail. One of the points that they bring out where I don't think enough is being done is to work with voluntary sector groups like Citizens Advice and others to help make sure that you help an individual who's trying to get back into work tackle the root cause of why they're there. It's called universal support, it's a wraparound package that is, it's designed to go with. And it's been rolled out well in some areas, less well in others. But if we step back from the detail, all the evidence so far, whether it's DWP's evidence from the government or from independent people like the IFS, shows that through universal credit, people are more likely to be in work, they're more likely to stay in work and earn more money. And it, it, it can be kind of put that to the side and say, yeah, but it's not working in some areas and the government needs to do more there. But that effect is huge because actually if you get someone to a job and help them to progress in it, you have a massive difference on people's uh, life outcomes and in tackling poverty. And this, this is something that all the evidence is showing is happening. But we've, now, we've, heard, we've also heard evidence, we've heard from lots of people here on Breakfast over the last year or so who've had terrible stories of delays, not getting the money on time, the forms being overly complicated. You've got to accept that for some people it has been a nightmare, hasn't it? Yeah. And I think uh, changing a welfare system that affects 8 million people is never going to be perfect. And there's a real responsibility on 
government in this to make sure that where they see an issue that they correct in. It's designed such that it rolls out, everyone says it's rolling out slowly. It's designed to roll out slowly such that they can stop, make changes as they see things not quite working. And you go back to November, the government was rightly being pressured because people were waiting too long before they got any money when they first came on. And they invested one and a half billion to, to change that. And I, and I think that's recognised that they did make those changes. There are other things they need to change uh, as it goes along to improve it. Uh, this NEA report is useful towards that. But let's not say that it's not working because all the evidence so far shows that it is. OK, well, I know you and Kayleigh disagree that all the evidence is showing that it's working. Um, Edward there, Kayleigh, mentioned that some changes have been made. What other changes need to be made quick? That's right. Changes do need to be made. And it's great that there is agreement that there's more to do on universal credit. Government need to really review that claims process and the way that they are paying people. Crucially, they need to make sure there's adequate support available for those who do need help. This benefit is for people who are looking for work, it's for people who can't work, say they're carers or have severe disabilities, and for those who are in work. For this to be a success, it's got to work for all of those groups. Thank you both very much indeed. And keen to hear from you at home this morning. Mm. If you've been affected by universal credit, by the change, if you're yet to be affected by it, do get in touch, let us know your experiences, and we'll uh, try to read some of your comments. Children have consumed more than one year's worth of sugar in less than six months. This is according to latest figures from Public Health England's National Diet and Nutrition So survey. here we are, middle of June, and they've yeah. already had enough a year's worth of for sugar. the whole year. Uh, let's have a look at the figures, shall we? Children aged between four and ten shouldn't be having more than the equivalent of five to six sugar cubes a day, but they're actually consuming... Well, more than twice that, 13 on average. That's about 52 grams of sugar. Lots of numbers. We'll show you how it looks in a moment. Sugary soft drinks, cakes, sweet spreads, table sugar. These are the sources of sugar that are creeping into their diets. And this high amount of consumption means that children are on track to consume a whopping 4,800 cubes of sugar by the end of the year. So Whopping. what does that look like? Yeah, what does that look like? It looks like that. 20 kilos of sugar. That's what it looks like. Can you imagine? I mean, the thing is, the problem is, is it creeps into your diet, doesn't it? Yeah. In, with other foods. Well, we, we'll talk about this more. Um, Nicola Ludlam Rain is with us. Good morning. Hello. What are you thinking? John? I'm seeing that and I just can't believe it. You know, I've got kids and, you, you know, you, you try and limit what they're eating sugar wise. A lot of it's yeah. hidden sugar, isn't it? But there's no hiding that. Definitely not. And I think what this report has shown is that the majority of the sugar is actually coming from fizzy drinks. So drinks between meals, maybe Coca-Cola, energy drinks, which really children between the ages of four to ten shouldn't be having at all. They should be drinking milk or water. Yeah, but it's not just those fizzy drinks. I mean, I, the reason I said to you, what are you thinking? Because as I know, as a parent, you've just yeah. gone... I try. I really well, that, that, try. That is and a gobsmacking sight. Yeah, type, and it's it? a frustrating message as well because we were talking about other places that sugar creeps into food. So you can't. Surely it can't just be the kids are when they're out of sight they're drinking fizzy drinks and all of that amounts. So that it's got to be elsewhere in the, terms of education and in terms of food and where it's creeping. Is it like tomato sauces? Who knows what it is. You're right. I think a lot of it is the snacky food. So we're um, a nation of snackers. We love our chocolate bars, our biscuits, sweets. So it's the things that are creeping in maybe after school. But cereals, for example, you know, yeah. you, you're mm. constantly told how healthy cereals are, aren't you? They've got your five grains or whatever they say. High to fibre. You. High fibre, exactly. But they still have lots of sugar in it. And these yeah. are these are basic foods, foodstuffs that are basic every part of everyday life. Yeah, and you're right. And on the cereal front, a lot of the cereals that are marketed to children with cartoons on are often sugar coated, honey coated, and chocolate coated. And they're the cereals which, you know, pester power the adults end up buying for the kids, but really it's the plainer cereals and it's the porridge that we should be giving our kids on a daily, on a regular basis. Do you know, those, those sugary ones are often the ones that are reduced as well, most yeah. heavily reduced. You get really good bargains, you go in 99p for a whole box of that, that's, that's a good deal. You're right, and I think the government obesity strategy is coming out later this month, later this year, sorry, and it'd be really good to see a tighter control, tighter 
control on the advertising and also on promotions. So it will be great to see more promotions put onto the healthy foods, things like fruits and vegetables, and giving parents meal ideas. I mean, the Change for Life campaign by Public Health England is fantastic. There's loads of healthy swaps and ideas on their website as well. But if you've got a ready meal, for example, which is piled with salt, fats, and sugars very, very often, and it's 99 pence, and then you have the alternative of fruit and you know high fiber, no grains or whatever, looking at four or five pounds at least. I think supermarkets have done a lot lately. They host um, free magazines on the till, and often you can feed a family of four for five pounds. So I think it's about encouraging parents to get into the kitchen, get their kids involved in cooking, and most councils do actually provide these cook and eat sessions. So helping parents with the simple cooking methods as well. And you mentioned cost. When it comes to a chocolate bar, I think now you're talking about 60, 70, 80 p. When it comes to a bunch of bananas, you can get five small ones for about a pound. Actually, but I was talking about ready meals. Ready compared meal. to yeah. fresh food, fresh cooking, because it's convenience, isn't it? And they're often yeah. much, much more cheap, much cheaper than the, the raw stuff. So I think it's about breaking down perception and that actually if you spend half an hour in the kitchen, you can whip up a really healthy meal for four, but it's about spending the time in the kitchen and preparing. Food. When you talk about giving parents lessons and supermarkets making changes, I can, I can hear thousands of people across the UK saying, Nanny State, don't tell us how to live our lives. What, what do you say to them? I think so. the research shows what we shouldn't be doing is controlling the child, so basically banning them from drinking certain things or eating certain things. What parents need to do is provide a healthy environment with food choices within limits. So teaching them about healthy foods and actually the, the sugary drinks and, and snacks are okay, but it's the moderation that counts. And also I think it's not obsessing about children's weight per se, but it's just teaching them to be healthy and active and to have more of the healthy foods on a regular basis. OK, thank you very much indeed. Thanks for coming in this morning and bringing your shopping with you. Yeah, well uh, done, Nicola. I'm sure it's not your <laughs> shopping. Uh, if you've got views, uh, do get in touch this morning in the usual way, especially if you're having to deal with pester power. How do you confront that? How do you persuade your children to take an apple rather than a chocolate bar? And talking of good cooking, we're going to be talking to the winner of Britain's Best Home Cook. Mm -hmm later on so maybe get some thoughts on that about how to avoid sugar in the home you take that and get a kitchen? sample of your terrible cooking as well <laughs> 27 minutes past seven we'll see no you shortly god knows what else is in it but... 43 if you're a parent you will know all about the problems the challenges of trying to limit the time your children spend on devices whether it's smartphones or tablets or whether it's computer games and according to a report today Tech companies are deliberately designing apps and games to keep young users using them for longer. It's, called, it's something called persuasive design. The campaign group, the Five Rights Foundation, says it's become so much of a problem amongst young people, it should be considered a public health issue. Um, we've been talking to some parents in Manchester to see what they make of it. It's quite colourful, isn't it? And it's quite in your face what slogans out there. The way technology is going, it's probably more important that they are good at it. Otherwise, by the time they're adults, they'll be behind everyone else. It's games and things like that, isn't it? And um, social media, you know, contacting other children and things like that. It's an easier way to do it, isn't it? I mean, I think when I was younger, I probably was drawn to it quite a bit as well, but I think now, lately as well, technology is getting quite a lot more intense. Parents across the company, country looking at those figures here. Yep, yep, I, I know that. I feel that. Uh, let's speak now to Alexandra Evans, who co-wrote uh, the Good. report for the Five Rights Foundation. Uh, you sort of represent children online, do you, basically? Um, it is such a challenge, isn't it, for parents knowing how to manage this? Because... When we were kids, we didn't have this as an issue, most of us. It's a new world. I think parents today are parenting, you know, at the frontier and, and, and I think they need guidance. So the purpose of the report was to try and articulate or, or get to the bottom of the things that we were hearing from the children that we speak to. And they were telling us that they're struggling. Actually, they're really overwhelmed by the demands that technology makes of them and they just feel like they're instinctively missing out on opportunities. So we, we did the research. We brought together... We, we considered... Uh, 
all the research to date and we discovered quite troubling impacts and on the health and well-being of our children. I think that, that, that fact that we mentioned that, that you found that, that some of these games and apps are deliberately designed to try to Absolutely. get kids, get all of us using it's, them it's more often. It's not a coincidence that we're all glued to our devices. But that's their design. Absolutely. Why are we shocked by that? Um, when, I don't think we are shocked, but I think that some people, when they look at their device, they consider, they, they consider that the fault is with them, that they ha don't have enough discipline, that they, they're not good enough parents, that they should be um, stricter with their children. But actually, what we're not talking about with our kids and with each other is the fact that we're, they are compulsive. They are designed what's to the make answer us... Then? What, do, what, do, what do you say to parents or, or families? Do you say, right, they're designed to keep you longer online and to make you feel almost guilty or FOMO, that fear of missing yeah, yeah. out, you know, when Absolutely. you're not looking yeah. at a notification. So the answer is you either get rid of it off your phone, which I think that people aren't going to do. Of course not. And also... And how do you... Or if, if it's already compulsive, it's already part of your everyday... You know, well, I think that we would. I mean, the, the report does give some advice to parents, which is that they should have conversations with their kids. They should be more understanding when their kids are struggling to disengage, and there should be they should be more patient around the family conflict that happens around devices. But actually, the report is not pointed towards parents. Our recommendations are pointed towards industry, and what we want industry to do is to recognise that this is a serious public health issue, and they should act more responsibly and prioritise our children's interests and health and well-being over their own commercial gain. And we also hope that government will make this a priority policy issue across all well, what departments. What does that look like, then? Because if they're businesses, and their business is to have an app and to have people use the app, what does being responsible with an app that you want... by creating an app that you want people to use, how, how do you do that responsibly, then? I think you would just uh, do what other industries do. They, if you're pointing a product towards a child, you have to make sure that it's age appropriate and that you have to balance your own commercial imperative with the needs of that child. And that's a social norm that we understand for every other industry. And the tech industry is no longer a special case. It's no longer in its infancy or nascency. It's now ready to grow up and take responsibility for our children. Interesting that that use of language you say that this is a serious public health situation. Yeah, absolutely. That's strong language. Why is it public health situation? Well, because at the moment we see that children are sleep deprived. They're suffering with anxiety, depression, low self-esteem, and educational outcomes are, are, are much poorer because of technology. Now, this is this is at endemic proportions. Eighty-three percent of twelve to fifteen-year-olds have a smartphone. At that rate, we must consider what the public health impact is and consider this a national priority. OK, Alexandra, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. I know lots of you have been commenting that, uh, ironically, using social media to get in touch and tell us your views on that this morning. Uh, do keep that coming, especially if you're a younger person as well. Um, I, know, I know kids who say to their parents, well, hang on, you're just as bad as we yeah. are as, as children. You know, you don't tell me not to use my phone when you're on your phone all the time. So, yeah. Keep in touch with us as well. Alexandra's coming back in back. Now, if you're a parent, you will know that limiting the time your children spend on their smartphones and their tablets and other devices, limiting it is not easy. And according to a report today, we kind of have a reason why. Because apparently tech companies are deliberately designing their apps and games to keep young users on them for longer. For all users, in fact. It's something called persuasive design. And the campaign group Five Rights Foundation says that it's become so much of a problem amongst younger people it should be considered a public health issue. We spoke to some parents in Manchester to see what they make of it all. It's quite colourful, isn't it? And it's quite in your face, what slogans out there. With the way technology's going, it's probably more important that they are good at it. Otherwise, by the time they're adults, they'll be behind everyone else. games and things like that, isn't it? And um, social media, you know, contacting other children and things like that, it's an easier way to do it, isn't it? I mean, I think when I was younger, I probably was drawn to it quite a bit as well, but I think now, lately as well, technology is getting quite a lot more intense. Well, joining us now is Alexandra Evans, who co-wrote the report today for the Five Rights Foundation, which describes itself as an advocate for children online, and also head teacher Andy Buckler. Morning to, to both Morning. of you. Thanks Morning. for coming in. Morning. Alexandra, this talk of a public health crisis over all of our addictions to, to smartphones and devices, is that, is that overstating a bit, public health crisis? 
I don't think it is. We, we, we compiled all the research on this issue and we found some really quite troubling impacts on the health and well-being of children, including sleep deprivation, high levels of anxiety, depression, low self-esteem, uh, poor educational outcomes. These are, these, are, these are not small issues. And when 83% of 12 to 15-year-olds have a smartphone, we need to actually be thinking about what the impact on children is. Who are you blaming? Are you blaming the, those who design the apps, the phone companies which allow, can host the apps, the people who put the phones into the children's hands? Where, where is the blame going to lie? Well, I think the first thing to say is that technology is a force for good. So I think anybody who says that the answer is to ignore the digital revolution is not really doing our kids any favours. Their future prospects do rely on their ability to harness technology. So when I'm looking at where the solutions might be, I look at tech, because these, as it, it is not a coincidence that we're all addicted to our iPhones. They have been designed specifically to make it harder for us to disengage and to make... And it as other phones are available, of course. I'm sorry, of course. And, um, and, and also to make them compulsive. So uh, I think that if tech is wanting to make money out of our children, that they must also take a responsible attitude towards the health and well-being of our kids. Andy, as a head teacher, I mean, you know, the, you know kids now it, it must get their homework often through their phones and they, they set it and they submit it that way. But, but what issues do you see among the kids in your school that, that worry you about uh, addiction potentially to, to devices? I think the report brings into focus what we've been seeing in education for a number of years. Um, the whole school readiness gambit is one that we're looking at very seriously at the moment. And when Alexander points out, 86% of children under three have got access to tablets and, uh, and devices and that limits their school readiness it limits their communication their social emotional readiness for school and what concerns me is that we're not investing enough time as a joined up exercise you mentioned blame earlier i think it's gone beyond that i think we need to really invest uh, in a multi-agency of support for parents to actually change the usage, bearing in mind the things that the report tells us about. How do you change the usage? What, where, where do you start? What do you look at? Do you look at things like social media platforms or do you look at games or...? I think we have to start somewhere and, and recognise that we've got issues with our young teenagers who have been exposed to this kind of technology for, say, four or five years. What's that going to look like for our three to four-year-olds? Four in 15 years' time. And I think we have to look and explore ways of, of developing a dialogue with tech companies, with I manufacturers. I wonder whether we need to just accept that this is the new normal. It's not, we didn't have this stuff when we were growing up, but this is what kids today will always have in their lives. Um, and that it can be a force for good, as you say. Absolutely. It allows them to explore the world and, and meet people and have new friendships and, and just find out stuff. We believe that the internet is a fantastic opportunity and that kids should be able to access it creatively, knowledgeably and fearlessly. But I think when you look at how they're using their devices at the moment, you have to consider what they're doing and why and whose interests are they serving. Because a child is a child until they reach maturity and not until they reach their smartphone. It's very smartphone. hard to, to legislate or set rules for it, though, isn't it? Either as a parent or as a government. Because how do you, how do you assess or, or, or say how addictive an app is or something like that or whether it was done deliberately to become uh, hooking you in? Well, the age-appropriate design code, which was introduced in the Data Protection Act uh, this year, does provide for the Information Commission to set design standards in relation to children's data online, so it proves that it is possible. So um, what we say is that it is, it is unreasonable to give a child a device and then reprimand them for, for using it compulsively and not being able to tear themselves away from it. And it is really complicated for families to be expected to mediate the fallout of tech companies' commercial imperatives. So uh, what we say is... Speak, parents speak to children, to talk about the issues, switch off those, fact, those design features that you can. But ultimately, government and industry do need to come together and recognise that this is a problem that needs to be solved upstream. OK. Thank you both very much indeed. It's quite a challenge, isn't it? I don't know where we begin, but uh, thank you. I'm sure a lot of people will, uh, will sympathise. Thank you. Thank Alexander, you. Andy, thank you. Um, we're going to go, we were talking about 21st century technology. Let's go back in time. Yeah, let's go back to the 19th century, when penny farthings were on the street, eh? Yeah, that was a simpler time, wasn't it? You remember it well, do you? Yeah, I didn't have to worry about apps and <laughs> controls and notifications.